Got it. <clears throat> so welcome all of us to the May meeting of Courageous Conversations. I'm Neil Dupree, and along with Amy Levy and Amy Floent, uh, we are the hosts from Diversity Action Team and the YWCA of Rock County and the Community Action of Rock and Walworth County. YWCA and Diversity Action Team are nonpartisan, and the uh, Community Action is apolitical. <laughs> So we're glad you could join us for this meeting's discussion about honoring AAPI culture. Asia is a large place and the Pacific Islands cover even more space. Here in the United States, we have had close connections with many of these peoples for better and for worse or some combination of the two. We want to highlight some members of our society from this region who have made special contributions to who we are as a nation. So if you'd like to be added to our email reminder list, I don't have to say that to you guys because you already are on. We'd like to remind you of the four agreements, stay engaged, experience discomfort, speak your truth, expect and accept non-closure. Uh, as you know, this conversation is recorded and YWCA will put it on their YouTube channel. Parts of the uh, Event may be recorded and used by media outlets if they're here at the end of the program at 7 p.m. Partner members will give announcements. Other participants are welcome to give announcements in the last half hour of unmoderated discussion, which we're calling the parking lot, in spite of what the uh, Gazette article said about the parking lot. We would also like to recognize that we are meeting on the ancestral lands of Native nations. In Wisconsin, there are 11 federally recognized Native American sovereign nations and one seeking to regain federal recognition. We acknowledge these indigenous communities who have stewarded this land through the generation and we pay respect to their elders past and present. Uh, Susan, if you could send me a copy of the Beloit Leagues land acknowledgement. I'd really appreciate that when you get a chance. Well, welcome all. And Amy is going to take us away. Thank you, Neil. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm going to start because we have so much to cover this evening. Um, I did just an outline sketch of how our evening will run. Uh, if you don't have your chat open, I will briefly read through it. Um, we're going to talk about AAPI and AANHPI. So we'll do an overview. Uh, we'll hear individual stories from difference makers. Uh, and then we're going to shift a little bit. We're going to talk about um, AANHPI, stereotypes and racism. Um, we'll talk about racial binaries and whiteness, and then we'll end with some poetry, uh, which I think poetry, uh, visual and spoken word, which I think are really beautiful. Um, so that will be our outline for the night. I'll go ahead and drop that first video in the chat and get that queued up so we can begin. I think AAPI means Asian American Pacific Islander. Is that right? The terms AA and PI got lumped together because of the government. But it's officially APA, right? Who knows? Asian Pacific American, which makes no sense. Ooh, APIDA? Uh, okay, Asian Pacific American. Indigenous Asian Pacific Islander. Oh, Desi American. Yes, yes, yes. Asian American, um, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander. Yes. <laughs> Come on. It is AANHPI Heritage Month. 
Officially declared so by President Biden, just in time for May 2021. Vital communities and very diverse communities within the Asian American, the Hawaiian, excuse me, and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders. Yes, it is a mouthful. It includes a huge range of people who can trace their ancestry to one giant continent of over 40 different countries. And about 25,000 islands in the Pacific Ocean. It's a lot, and the name for this month has changed quite a few times since it was first signed into law by Jimmy Carter back in 1978. So this really begs the question, who gets to be Asian American? And why is it so hard for us to find an identity or acronym to share? Welcome to People's History of Asian America. Do I think the term Asian American includes me? I, I, yes, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of torn with that one. I feel like it mis mixes race with like citizenship or nationality. If I do choose to be a Japanese um, citizen, does that mean I'm no longer Asian American? I don't gravitate towards that term first. I tend to gravitate towards Filipino American first. Prof, do you consider yourself Asian American, Asian Canadian, Pacific Islander? I'm actually none of the above. Hmm. I'm Ilocano from Toronto. See, my family and I are from the Philippines. My mom's side is from a region called Northern Luzon. So culturally, we're called Ilocano people. Ooh, that's interesting. But how do you explain that to like most people? So my easy answer is that I'm Filipino. And being from Canada, we don't really have this concept of Filipino Canadian, the way that y'all have it down here with Filipino American. That's a pretty crazy concept for me to wrap my mind around as someone who grew up with everything being hyphen American. Why are there no Filipino Canadians? Well, it has something to do with the fact that the U.S. has ethnic studies and Canada doesn't. First time I heard Asian American, I, I didn't know whether it was like a white American term put on us or wh whether it was us kind of being like, hey, let's form an alliance together so people stop killing us and we can actually have unity between each other. Asian American was actually a chosen term that emerged around the same time that ethnic studies was created as a field. In 1968, inspired by the Black Power Movement, two Berkeley students, Yuji Chiyoka and Emma G, coined this term, Asian American. You know, having an umbrella identity that people could unite under does seem pretty powerful. So why all this talk of changing it? Well, maybe we should actually talk about expanding on it. So as we know, Asian American has its roots in political organizing. So at its core, it's a political identity. But as this community grows in numbers and geographical diversity and migration histories, the term starts to fall a little short. I don't feel that Asian American all the time includes uh, Southeast Asians or, or darker Asians. Asia is a huge country with so many different nations, different nationalities, different cultures. Um, I do consider Lao and Laotian Americans to be a part of under that umbrella. But as a Lao American, I don't feel I'm as represented. The term Asian American or even South Asian has been something that I had never been associated with growing up in Kenya and South Africa. I think when we are talking about particularly East Asian experiences, that we should identify them as East Asian the same way that we identify South Asian experiences as South Asian. Another shortcoming is the way statistics get aggregated under the broad term Asian American. Let's take a look at a very common stereotype that all Asians are crazy rich. The crazy rich Asian stereotype makes me feel really broke. I... Okay, Fred, time... I can say with a complete authority that the crazy rich Asian stereotype has never really applied to my ex lived experience. Myself as a Pacific Islander feel like I am wealthy and spiritual in the spiritual sense, though, which, you know, that's special unto itself. On paper, it seems like we're doing pretty well economically. But when you expand on that data, 
you'll see that the wealth is concentrated among select racial groups, mainly Indian, Filipino, Chinese, and Japanese Americans. And when you look at the other end of the spectrum, you'll find Burmese, other Southeast Asian, and Pacific Islander communities. It's important to disaggregate data because we are deemed insignificant and we are deemed too small to be a community on our own um, as Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders um, or NHPI. Lao Americans, uh, majority of them who came to the U.S. are refugees. And it is the impact of American engagements in Vietnam that brought me here to this country. What the data hides is the fact that many Southeast Asians arrived in the U.S. as refugees. It also hides the fact that the Pacific Islands, like Guam, the Mariana Islands, and Samoa, are still territories of the U.S., which function like colonies. A little history here is important to know. Many of these islands were taken through imperial wars. In 1898, after the Spanish-American War, the United States acquired Spain's island colonies in the Treaty of Paris. After that, Guam, the Philippines, and Puerto Rico became U.S. colonies. In that same year, the United States illegally annexed the Kingdom of Hawaii. Which is why, as much of a mouthful as it is, AANHPI is a really important acronym. The histories of Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, as well as Filipinos and other Southeast Asians, is one that's steeped in war and colonization. But these histories are often rendered invisible under the label Asian American. Let's turn back to you, Adrian. What does it mean to say you're Ilocano from Toronto? For me, I identify as Ilocano first and foremost because it challenges our assumptions of what being Filipino means. But for that matter, whatever the heck Asian and Asian American mean. See, it might be easier for me to say Filipino, but the whole point of me telling you about my native land in the Philippines is to make all of us question our assumptions of identity and ancestry. And most importantly, to remind you that the U.S. has a history of colonization that impacts how I talk about myself, too. And I can see how knowing this history of colonization makes you very weary of things like nationality or neat identity labels. And as for months like this one, for me, these commemorations are important. But even more important is sustained curriculum. Now, going back to what I mentioned earlier about ethnic studies not being taught in Canada. That's one thing that drew me to the U.S. to become an ethnic studies professor. See, it was a pretty radical thing that in the U.S., this field was created out of activism. And it was radical, too, that Asian American identity was first and foremost created as a political identity. And well, even the name of our show, A People's History of Asian America, is really about the political identity of this community, which is why it's so important for us to discuss the history, evolution, pros and cons of AANHPI Heritage Month. I feel like this month tokenizes my community. I've never been asked to do so many things. And I also wonder about where will we be next month? Do I feel like this month belongs to me? Like, and my people? No, not really. Sometimes it just feels a little shallow to me. And um, in addition to like Black History Month, it's like, why do we need to designate a certain box for people of color to exist in? We don't just want a seat at the table, we want a voice at the table. We don't want to be the diversity hire. You don't want your face paraded out there as the Asian American uh, face. You want to be the Asian American voice and you want to be able to bring others up with you. So I think inclusion as opposed to representation is to say we we are powerful, we have a voice, and we want to be a part of the decision making as well. I am very hopeful for the future of Asian America, um, of Native Hawaiian recognition, of Pacific Islander multiple identities when we uplift each other and support each other and connect with each other and cross-culturally do that. I feel we rise together. So what do you guys think about using AAPI, APIDA, APA, 
AANHPI, or Asian American? Which terms have you heard and which one feels most inclusive to you? Tell us in the comments below and make sure you tune in next week for another episode of A People's History of Asian America. This episode. Okay, so there was lots of information in that video. Uh, I'm going to open up the discussion. If you need for me to call on you, please put a question mark in the chat. Um, or you can type your comment in the chat, whichever is easiest, so we're not stepping on each other in conversation. Neil, go ahead. I was really uh, impressed by the guy who's from uh, Ilocos Norte in the Philippines. I got to visit that place when I was in Peace Corps in the Philippines and have felt a very close connection with people from the Philippines since then, although I haven't really pursued it here in Janesville. Uh, so not only that, but our training was in Hawaii, which of course is so uh, beautiful and uh, multicultural. And so I felt connected to this issue for quite a while. Well, thank you for sharing that, Neil, um, and highlighting the importance of how our lived experiences um, connect us. So. Great connection there. Anyone else, any comments from that first video before we move on to the next one? I mean, anyone who joined us after I put our framework in the chat, um, I'll copy that and put it in the chat again so you can see that. All right, um, so we will shift to our next video and I'll drop that in the chat for you. It's real. Nervous is a thing. Uh, do I look at the camera? Oh, right there. Very natural, right? <laughs> so we'll see. Okay, tell me your name and where are you from? My name is Glendo Tautua. My family is from the beautiful island of Samoa. My name is Naomai Takai. I am from the kingdom of Tonga, the most gorgeous island in the Polynesian Pacific. My name is Frank Yara. I'm from the Marshall Islands. My name is Shannon Kaupua. Originally, I'm from Hawaii. My name is Amelia Mbai. I'm from the Fiji Islands. So on the map, where Seattle kind of go this way, which is south, where? you hit Hawaii. And then after Hawaii, you go further south. It's a small dot in the middle of the South Pacific. Fiji is located kind of southwest of Honolulu and a little bit north of New Zealand. Then you keep going a little bit more past Fiji, and it's a little tiny dot on the map. If you look at the map, the name the Marshall Islands is bigger than actual land mass, I guess. I think for Tonga, we're mainly known for being one of the friendly islands. We're happy go lucky people. We're just big on life, big heart. Big bodies, big minds. We are Pacific. Do you feel like Pacific Islanders, there's a stereotype about them in the mainstream? Uh, okay. I think we're mainly known for being people that play in sports or being physically fit or playing football. When I was young, one of the biggest stereotypes was that we are intimidating. I still experience that today. People take us for granted, no matter what ethnicity that we're coming from, whether it's Samoan side, Tongan side, Hawaiian side. Uh, again, they think that we're just thugs. I'm in a public space. People look at me and feel I'm unapproachable. When if they met me, they would know the kind of person I am. Nah, we're not like that. Total heart, if you get to know us, we travel in packs because that's just family value. And it's not only our name, it's also in the way we, we behave. Your place in society, that is your family dictates that. Family is everything. Going back to foundation of being Pacific Islander. I don't know if you know the term remit remittances. A lot of us have family back in the islands. 
um, that family here in the United States support and help. And so a lot of the economy is driven by remittances where families are sending money back to Samoa. First off, America is a first world country and Fiji is a third world country. So there's a big old gap economically. We are still trying to grasp how to survive here financially. Like credit score is not a thing in our islands. And so that's a thing over here. Definitely there's a lot in, in healthcare um, to lack of understanding of how to navigate healthcare. We're not used to the idea of, you know, having to travel to multiple places for these different specialties. Healthcare is not as good back home. A lot of our people die prematurely because we don't have advanced care. What do you wish society and the media knew about the Pacific Islander culture? You know, sometimes like people just ask me, are you someone? And I just say yes, because I don't want to go through with like having to explain like what I am and then explain that it's a completely different you know, island and culture. Our culture is rich. Work hard to stay together. We're a community that loves to have a good time, that loves to stay together, that is continuously looking for ways to support each other. Because everybody's your family. Everybody knows each other. And regardless, they take you in. That is something I, I trash. What does being Pacific Islander mean to you? Being Pacific Islander means everything. It is family. It is always family for, for, for me. Super proud to be Samoan. If I could have a Tongan flag on my forehead every day, I would do it. It almost feels innate. I've always been someone to share the last piece of something or to give up my seat for an elder. To me, uh, when I think about at least a specific elder or specifically being Marshallese, I think, I think about God. What do you bring to the table? That's something that they ask me. And I'm like, Polynesian, Pacific Island, dear girls, if you want to ask them, what do you bring to the table? We build the table. We are the table. I am Pacific Islander. I am here. Come see me. I'd love to meet you. All right. Um, same rules as before, our comments are open for that video. Any questions that you would like to post to the group, anything that resonated with you, the floor is open. Great, great sequence of, of uh, uh, comments and interviews, I thought. And one of the things I learned when I was in Hawaii was that the way we pronounce these islands is not the way that they pronounce it. So it's Tonga, not Tonga. And it's Samoa, not Samoa, Samoa. Anyway, um, but the, the whole sense of, well, I mean, the one woman said, um, Pacific Islands are third world and the United States is first world. And so there is a, a great gap and a lot of people come from the islands to Hawaii, for example, for healthcare and so forth. Right, no, thanks for pointing out those nuances, very important. Anyone else? Well, for most of us, I'm going to say older people, we learned about these islands from watching World War II movies on uh, the Pacific. <laughs> you know, that's where you learned about all the island hopping that was done and what ones were being contested. And it shows you, or, or it speaks to me, of the simple reducing the people as well as the islands to a utilitarian purpose in warfare, in warfare and uh, of economy of, of what can you ship where, what can you store where, what can you land where, especially when airplanes didn't have the range that they do in recent years. Uh, and uh, to leave it at that level is uh, somewhat shameful. No, I appreciate that. And Steve, that's actually a beautiful segue. <clears throat> um, if you'll notice kind of our itinerary for the evening. So we did an, an, an overview um, and then we went into some individual stories and now we're going to um, highlight some additional individuals. I have some separate videos um, for people that we should know that we probably don't. Um, and then 
part of the celebration, which may be considered unique, is not just great job, look at how fantastic this person is, um, but to really uplift the humanity and the struggle of people who have different lived experiences than us. Um, so that's something that we're going to dig into this evening. Um, so the first individual we're going to look at is Grace Lee Boggs, uh, and I will go ahead and share my screen so we can watch that video. I'm not sure why I am who I am. I think it does have something to do with the fact that I was born female and born Chinese. Grace Lee Boggs was one of the nation's oldest human rights activists. Let me make a challenge to you, okay? How are we going to create a new vision for this country? She worked on creating better community and world for over 70 years. I think we have to get to that point that we are the leaders we've been looking for. There's a big stereotype that API will be very soft spoken and they won't ask for help or they won't try to make change or anything. I wanted to combat that and see others who had combated that in the past and she came up almost immediately. Generally, you see people fighting about things that might affect them, but it's, it's really inspiring to see someone fighting for another community or fighting for other people who might not have the same rights as them. One of the difficulties when you're coming out of oppression and out of a bitter past is that you get a, a concept of the Messiah and you expect too much from your leaders. And I think we have to get to that point that we are the leaders we've been looking for. I know that you definitely have a lot of power to create change and I definitely wanted to provide more of a space for youth to grow and find their voices and she definitely wanted that. Certain events in the news um, and different attacks against API elders. I'm saddened by our elders being attacked. I'm saddened by what has happened in the world. And I'm saddened by all the communities of color that are affected by racism. My family member was coughed at just walking down the street, and that was really personal to me. And it was just a few houses down from my own. So it was very sort of like, oh, this is going to happen to my community members too, and this will happen to my family. I don't do something about it. We definitely took away that youth could definitely have a big impact on the world. Let me make a challenge to you, okay? With people of color becoming the new American majority in many parts of the country, how are we going to create a new vision for this country? And they can see themselves making a difference, they also become different. That has to be part, an integral part of the process of revolution. There's sometimes a mentality brought across by either the American people or historically the American government that AAPI will always be a foreign group in America, which is definitely not good for anyone, especially youth. That mentality and that mindset can be perpetuated by not hearing about AAPI within history. studies is really important because although it has now become a very politicized issue, it really just means that everyone's histories are represented and all of America's events, good or bad, are all represented because if you don't learn your history, then you are doomed to repeat said history. So that probably means a few bad things in there that I don't think we want to happen again. So um, 
Yeah. A lot of people are like, don't question America. That's not, that's not patriotism. That is brainwashing. I am so sorry, but you need to question anything in any facets of your life. Because if you don't, then you will accept horrible truths about the world that aren't true or that they're really bad. So keep questioning. And I really like that mentality that she had. How are we going to create a new vision for this subject? <laughs> Sorry about that. Let me get this straightened out. There we go. All right. Um, so many of us may not have been familiar with Grace Lee Boggs. Um, I love that her message was inspirational and intergenerational. Um, the thing that stood out and resonated for me is when she said, when they see themselves making a difference, they become different. And she was talking about youth, but I think that applies to all of us. When we see ourselves making a difference, we become different. Um, what resonated with you from the video? Well, in watching the, I'm way in, in watching the videos, uh, I'm th thinking about power, the, the status quo power structure in America. And for that, for that power structure to continue to exist, they have to, they have to keep dividing and differentiating between groups. So there's always another group that they can blame, lay blame to for whatever is happening in this country that is really the fault of the of the leadership of the current power structure. Divide and conquer. Yep. All right, thank you for that, Wayne. So the next video that we'll review is Kalpana Chalwa. Um, so we will go ahead and get started. Finally tonight, our Hidden History series. We explore the legacy of the first Indian American astronaut who gave her life in the name of research, science, and exploration. Dr. Kalpana Chabla, uh, also a rookie uh, mission specialist. In 1997, Kalpana Chabla realized her lifelong dream of traveling to space. She was the first American of Indian descent to accomplish that feat. Once, it all seemed unimaginable. For me, it was very far-fetched to think um, I'd get to fly on the space shuttle because I lived in India in a very small town. And um, forget about space, I didn't even know if my folks were going to let me go to the engineering college. She did get an aerospace engineering degree from Punjab Engineering College in India and a PhD from the University of Colorado Boulder. In 1994, she was one of the 20 applicants accepted in NASA's astronaut program out of a pool of nearly 4,000. She was assigned to the shuttle Columbia as a mission specialist and prime robotic arm operator. On her first mission, Chavla used the arm to deploy a research satellite. It was intended to study the sun, but malfunctioned. On her second mission, she oversaw research on the impact of low gravity, ranging from crystal growth to cancer. But on the return to Earth on February 1st, 2003, just minutes before it was to land in Florida, the Columbia disintegrated, killing the entire crew. NASA suspended space flights for two years while it investigated the disaster, which was blamed on damage the shuttle suffered at liftoff. In India, there was shock and horror. Many said tearful prayers at Chavla's hometown of Kurnal. And liftoff, the SS Kalpana Chavla takes flight sights set on the International Space Station. In 2020, NASA launched a commercial spacecraft named after the modest but determined woman who pursued her passion, inspired others, and contributed to the cutting edge of science. <laughs> All 
All right, the floor is open. This fits with somebody that you haven't heard of that you probably should have. I didn't recognize her name at all, but what a what an is. Yep. So it's exactly why we have these types of programs. Um, we'll move on to our next video. So that link is in the chat. Uh, we will focus on Yuri Kachiyama. Imagine if you were forced to move hundreds of miles away from home just because of your ethnicity. This was what happened to more than 120,000 Japanese Americans during the Second World War, including Yuri Kochiyama. Her experience turned her into a powerful advocate for marginalized communities. Born in 1921 in San Pedro, California, Yuri grew up in both Japanese and American cultures. After Japan attacked Pearl Harbor during World War II, the U.S. government suspected some Japanese Americans of spying for Japan. The FBI arrested Yuri's father, who was in poor health. He died shortly after his release from FBI custody. Yuri and the rest of her family were sent to an internment camp in Arkansas. In the camp, she met Bill Kochiyama, and after the war, they married, moved to New York City, and settled in Harlem. Yuri and Bill got involved in the civil rights movement, organizing community meetings in their home to support equal rights for Black Americans. They invited prominent activists like Malcolm X and the Freedom Riders to speak to the community. She also attended demonstrations to protest nuclear weapons and commemorate those lost in the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan. As members of Asian Americans for Action, Yuri and Bill testified at hearings, demanding that the government recognize the unfair treatment of Japanese Americans during World War II. When her husband testified in New York, Yuri led other activists carrying signs outside the hearings. Yuri herself later testified in Washington, D.C. Due to their efforts, President Reagan issued a formal apology, and Congress granted every survivor $20,000 in reparations. Yuri continued to fight for the rights of others, including those Yuri believed to be wrongfully convicted, and spoke out against racial profiling and anti-Muslim sentiment, particularly after the 9-11 attacks drawing on her own experiences during World War II. Yuri Kochiyama passed away in 2014. Her lifelong activism and tireless advocacy continues to impact many marginalized communities. How can government reparations help to heal a past injustice? All right, so lots there. Um, what resonated from that video? The fact that the U.S. government finally recognized the injustice of the uh, concentration camps for Japanese uh, Americans, citizens. Of, of the United States. And provided reparations. Yeah, not enough, but, oh, sorry. No, you're fine. <laughs> That's why we're here. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm from Tacoma, Washington, and I remember um, my parents were in Hawaii when they were doing that, and they didn't do it in Japan. They didn't do it in Hawaii. There was too many, too many Japanese there, and they were just horrified that it had happened, and um, there was a, a woman in, well, girl, whatever. She was like here behind me, Kathy Tanabe. And she was, she tried to get it through our high school that we would, you know, she was bringing it up. This is in the late, early seventies, sorry, early, early seventies, late sixties. And yeah, and I'd heard about it all my life from my parents. So 
it was just shocking how many of my friends didn't know about it and how it took forever for anyone to really acknowledge it. So thank you for showing this one. I was thinking, what are we going to have the thing about, about Japanese concentration camps? So thank you for showing this one. Well, the credit is not all mine. Amy Flown helped to provide um, some of these videos. So thank you to Amy in her absence. Um, and, and I agree, not enough reparations, but reparations were given uh, when, when some groups are still um, <laughs> having discussions had um, or, or no discussion at all over whether or not reparations are even possible. Yeah. Right. I agree. Yeah. The, la the last church I served, uh, we had a woman who was uh, in one of the internment camps as a young girl uh, in the camp in Arkansas. I'm not sure how many camps there were in Arkansas. There may have been just that one. So that raised the issue of, ah, did she know uh, uh, this other woman? Uh, but uh, we also had a woman of a similar age, maybe a little bit older, who lived in Arkansas at that time, whose church um, made up kind of care packages or gift packages that they took to the camp. So that was a, bi a, a, a bond that those two women kind of shared of, uh, although they weren't aware of ever meeting or anything, but of, of having that connection and, and somewhat of care. Uh, at this point in my life, it makes me feel uh, poorly <laughs> that I never used her as a uh, a point for a broader discussion. Uh, the The congregation was certainly aware of her past and supported her, you know, readily and everything else like that. But it could have been uh, perhaps used at uh, at some point to can you tell us your story a, a little more about what happened so that we could be a little more aware. No, thank you for sharing that, Steve. All right, so we're gonna shift. Um, the next person we're gonna highlight is, it, her name is pronounced two different ways in the video, um, Patsy Mink Takimoto or Patsy Takimoto Mink. Um, so just wanted to make you aware of that. The link is there in the chat and I will share my screen. Who was the first woman of color to serve in this body in the United States House of Representatives. It was a woman named Patsy Mink. Patsy Takamoto Mink. U.S. Representative Patsy Takamoto Mink was born in Hawaii in 1927. In 1964, now this is five years after Hawaii became a state, Patsy ran for the United States Congress, the first woman of color and the first Asian American. Before her career in politics, Mink studied chemistry and zoology. She wanted to be a doctor, but her medical school applications were rejected because of her gender. She applied to law school instead. When she graduated, she was one of only two women in her law class. She had trouble finding a job after graduation. Law firms did not want to hire her because she was a woman, an Asian American, and in an interracial marriage. She opened her own law firm instead, becoming the first Japanese American woman to practice law in Hawaii. When Hawaii became a state, Mink ran for Congress. She lost the first time, but she secured a seat in the Senate in 1962. Two years later, she was elected to the House of Representatives. She was re-elected many times over the course of her career. As a politician, Mink fought for education, civil rights, equal rights, and the environment. I truly believe that the Constitution calls us to ration and to reason today and to the adoption of common sense and for the belief in equal equality in this country. Patsy Takamoto Mink co-wrote Title IX, a federal law that prohibits gender-based discrimination. It helped more women earn scholarships, play sports, and get college degrees by requiring schools that receive funding from the U.S. government to use the money on women's educational and athletic programs, as well as men's. We are here to uh, celebrate Title IX, but even more, we're here to celebrate 
a God-given talent of every woman and girl who has been benefited by it. After Mink died in 2002, the law was renamed after her to honor her. All right, the floor is open. Just a sarcastic comment. Now we know who to blame for all the bad stuff of Title IX that the attacks seem to be coming out now. I'm, I'm just blown away by it, but uh, uh, the, the number of shots currently coming up about how bad Title IX is and the, the terrible re, uh, results of it. Well, Steve, um, our future sarcasm, we are definitely not blaming Patsy Takamoto Mink. <laughs> um, anything that resonated from that video? Yay for Hawaii. All right, so the last individual video that we will review uh, features Mine Okubo. Uh, so I will share my screen. Mine Okubo, 17 East 9th Street. Maneo Kubo, a Japanese American, moved to her Greenwich Village apartment from California in 1944. She had just been released from captivity in World War II U.S. internment camps for Japanese citizens and Japanese Americans. Her remarkable illustrated book chronicles her experience. Today, Citizen 13660 is considered to be the first true graphic novel. Amazing to consider. Okubo was second generation Japanese American. She had never been to Japan and spoke very little Japanese. She was one of 120,000 Japanese Americans and Japanese citizens who were forcibly removed from their homes after the attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. They were given just three days preparation. Okubo and her brother were first sent to the registration center a former horse racing track. There, they slept in nine by 20 foot stalls that smelled of manure. In drawings, washes, and text, she depicted the squalid conditions, group toilets, and showers. Okubo wrote, cameras and photography were not permitted in the camps, so I recorded everything in sketches, drawings, and paintings. Her 2,000 drawings and washes made up an indelible record of a little seen chapter of American history. Assigned the family unit number 13660, Okubo wrote, the number was on suitcases and everything that you owned. You became a number. Okubo had already distinguished herself as an artist before her imprisonment. After the war, once settled in New York, Okubo sat down to write Citizen 13660 in this apartment here on 9th Street. Her Greenwich Village apartment would become a home away from home for many Japanese Americans who had left the West Coast after being released from internment camps. She died in this same village apartment in 2001, living to age 88. Seemingly an anonymous New Yorker, she had, in fact, illustrated the most searing account of these atrocities. She was often interviewed about her years in the camps and was a crucial activist witness to history. Did you catch when she died? How, how old she was? I didn't catch that. I believe they said 88. 
So I don't know if anyone in the meeting loves graphic novels, but my son definitely does. So this was a fact that I wasn't aware of, um, that she created what is considered the first graphic novel. So I thought that was amazing. Um, Actually, more than a novel, a memoir, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we will shift um, to stereotypes and racism and racial binary and whiteness. Um, I have a few videos lined up. So I will start with the first one right after I drop that. There's a really good King of the Hill episode where the neighbors, you know, from Laos, he's Laotian. Hank Hill's like, so are you Chinese or are you Japanese, right? And then the guy's like, no, I'm from Laos. Like, you know, it's a Southeast Asian country. And then in the end, he's like, okay. He's like, so are you Chinese or are you Japanese, right? <laughs> Every time I meet somebody new, the question always comes up, where are you from? I always want to say Minnesota, but you know what they mean. I was at a bar and someone asked me my name and I said, Rachel. And then they said, okay, but like, what's your real name? Chinese are not the same as Japanese, are not the same as Koreans, are not the same as Filipinos or Thai or, you know, Indians. And not every single Asian person gets into college. Not every single Asian person goes to a great school. Not every single person has, you know, a great job. I can still be Japanese American and know that part of myself and know that history but it's also okay to still identify as uh, a, like a, a gangly little suburban kid um and i'm fine with that i remember seeing like wayne's world growing up and i was like oh tia Carrere, she's filipino uh, uh, hawaiian filipino and they're like no she's playing cantonese and i was like oh we don't even get to be ourselves we don't even get to be who we are we have to play it something else most times in high school or places like this you don't really have an outlet where you can talk about these asian american issues even in the workplace you know you need asian american mentors who experience the bamboo ceiling something that happens in corporate america so most times if you actually look at it you'll see that a lot of asian americans for instance you know they're in middle management or they're in engineering, but you don't really see them in high CEO roles. And the reason being is oftentimes our culture, for instance, you know, my mom always tells me, don't ask for a raise, keep your head down. You know, when, when you do your work, your boss will basically, you know, see that you're doing well and he'll give you a raise. But in America, it's not like that. America's the squeakiest wheel gets the oil, right? If people sometimes say that Nobuko, just forget about Japanese-ness, just Open up yourself more and be more expressive and be more upfront and straightforward. That goes back to the stereotype of like, oh, like no one talks about Asians because Asians don't speak up. My parents didn't want me to learn the language. They thought that if I were to learn Tagalog at home, that I would have um, an accent and I would have the struggles that they had because they were shamed for having thick accents when they first immigrated to the U.S. I think I struggle with it even now that talking to my parents, I think they do regret those moments of wanting something different for me. I have two younger sisters who are 10 and 8, and I really feel it's my responsibility to help them come to terms with the identity crisis I know they're going through and bridging the gap between the American culture that they deal with at school and the Asian culture they deal with at home. There is just so much beauty in the distinction and different cultures out there that I think it would be to everyone's advantage to learn more about all the different places we come from. I love seeing that these communities are, are asking for representation because it's so important to me. And I think my ownership is getting to be a part of that. And even celebrate the fact that it's so cool to be different, to have something to offer that someone else may not and to exchange ideas rather than just try to be the same idea. I think that concept is just, it frees you so much, so much freedom in that. All right, before we shift to our next video, is there anything that resonated? What is soul pancake? 
Oh, that the organization that produced the video. So if you want more information, <clears throat> just click on the link in the video in the chat and you can pull that up. All right, so the next <clears throat> video we are going to watch um, is Asian Americans share their experiences with racism. Um, and then I'll follow that up with um, racial binary and whiteness. Um, and, and pay attention to the, the contrast of the two videos, because so often when we talk about race uh, in America, it's a black and white issue and other people of color and marginalized communities um, get lost in that. So I'll play both videos back to back um, and then we'll come back and share what resonated or any comments. Um, this is my first time actually sharing this, so it's kind of crazy. My name is Stephen Ho. I am 31 years old and I am Vietnamese. I'm Mike Kim. I'm Korean American and I'm 43 years old. Hi, I'm Nikki Suhu. I am 32 and I'm Chinese American. My name is Brian Shiyama. I'm 26 years old. I'm half Korean and half Japanese. My name is Kian Fan. I'm 29 years old and I'm Chinese American. My name is Michelle K. Hanabusa. I'm 29 years old from Los Angeles, California, and I am a fourth generation Japanese American. Regarding my own interactions with racist comments and discrimination, I remember going over to a friend's house with some friends and his mother kind of just like looked at me and she was like why is there a monkey in this room <sighs> i remember like going home and telling my father this and he was so upset um, but I didn't say anything, you know, because I didn't know, like, how you were supposed to respond. There's a story of when I used to ride the school bus um, early in the morning. For three months straight, I would just throw up, and I didn't know what it was. And so they sent me to the nurse's office, and... They said, you're going to have to miss first period. You're going to have to wash your jeans here. First period is when all these racial taunts would happen. It got smart. So every time I would throw up in the morning before this period, I would throw up on my clothes intentionally so I could miss first period and the racial slurs that were thrown at me. One experience that I had when I first kind of starting, it was one of my first, uh, I guess, lead roles uh, on, on the stage. And there was this one point where I was in the middle of a very long monologue. It was like three minutes or something. And someone in the audience kept chanting Ching Chong for like the entire duration of the monologue. And it was so shocking to me because, because you know, obviously I'd experienced racism and I've experienced things like that in the past, but never when I was performing. I can't see it going away anytime soon. It's so much a part of, you know, at least my daily life. I'm constantly reminded that I am Asian. I guess during middle school is probably one of the toughest times, uh, especially when my grandma would be the one you know, making lunch for me. And I would open up my lunchbox and all my friends would be like, ew, what is that? <laughs> what are you eating? That smells gross. I just kind of felt ashamed. Uh, I, I remember that I would just throw away my lunch every single day. I would just come back home and kind of tell my grandma, like, I don't want, you know, rice and all this Asian Korean food, Japanese food. I want to be like normal, like others. It kind of makes me feel a little bit angry. I wish I could have just kind of stood up for myself and kind of introduced them to the culture. Like, but at the same time, I didn't know. So obviously, you know, I just thought I was white. So the conversations with all these hate crimes do come up with my friends just because it makes us worry about our parents. There's always that constant thought of it's going to happen to my mom if she just walks alone in the streets of LA. You, know, you just never know what would happen.
and it's just heartbreaking to see that there are people like that exist. So my last name's Hope, and I the jokes were endless. It wasn't something that I would go home and try to explain to my family. I never, I never said anything to them that, hey, this is happening, and you know, it's hurting me because I, I don't know if I registered it like that. It sucks thinking about it now, but it, I just, I let it happen. If I leaned into it, 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 it hurt less. Like, yep, that's me. Hose here. It didn't work. You know, I, I felt terrible the whole time. But externally was me laughing with them, trying to laugh with them instead of being confrontational. I do, I, I do believe that if that pain was taken away, I feel like maybe I would have been more courageous to, you know, pursue the things that I loved earlier on. For anyone, it doesn't matter if you're Asian or Black, Latino, it doesn't matter if, if someone attacks you at your core and you're just taking it day after day, year after year, what that does to you tomorrow, um, the years after, Trying to let go of some of these stories in my head, um, it's so hard. So my experience growing up with racism as an Asian American, when you asked me that question originally, I was like, I am not even sure what to say. Have I experienced racist things? I remember in high school, people called me a banana, yellow on the outside, white on the inside. But what I thought was actually more interesting when I started to think about my relation to these racist acts was that I actually embraced them. And I, I didn't think that they were racist because I wanted to be accepted. I wanted to feel good about being like everybody else, like being white. And then I realized when you actually made me start thinking about it and how kind of sad that really is that I have to be that token Asian or that I have to embrace these things in order to be successful. I like don't know how to feel because I feel shameful, you know, like I feel bad that, that I, I'm, I am not more Asian, <laughs> you know, that I don't want to embrace it because it won't make me fit in or it won't make me be loved or it won't make me feel protected. And I know that my deepest uh, fear is, is like that I need, I feel that I need protection from the world. There's a sense of numbness in reality. It's more just like compartmentalization, right? It's not really numb. It does affect me still. You know, you hear it enough times and it, it, it hurts a little bit less, of course, but it's still there, right? I mean, it still brings up those, you know, feelings and, and those memories and all that. So. I do have hope that things can get better. We felt so voiceless for so long. We never felt like we did have allies in this. So I think trying to build those connections, you know, and, and gaining support, I think is, is very important. And I do believe that all forms of oppression are linked. When I started doing comedy, it was to get my story out. One of the unique things about the stand-up, some of the stand-up that I do is I speak Vietnamese. Initially, I didn't think people would go for it, but I did a couple segments of me speaking Vietnamese and translating it to English, and the audience loved it. They responded, you know, well, and so that told me that, you know, they are ready to hear our stories. We just have to put in the effort to write it down and believe that it's worthy of stage time or screen time. My strategy is to play in the game so you can change the rules because i would hope for it for anyone of any color to not have to consider with limitations the color of their skin in determining the type of life that they want to live my whole mission was to try to fit in and try to be accepted by other communities that don't look like me i was so integrated in a different part of me um, my entire life and then college that post-college that was really the journey when I was like you know what I need to change 
everything completely because this isn't working. And I didn't know what that meant just then, but I started to explore and really try to learn my own heritage and my own culture. I was like, yo, this is dope. Like our community and our culture is so cool. And I think that's when something sparked inside me where I was like, I did not embrace any of this growing up. When I started to really find my purpose and like my voice, that's when I started to really feel confident enough to say something and to speak up because I couldn't just sit there and stay silent. I'm very proud of being Korean American. I'm proud of being Asian American. Um, and I'm proud of trying to voice my opinion and tell my story. I made a promise to myself that I'm not going to mute my experience based on making someone else more comfortable. In general, I feel like conversations about race don't involve Asian Americans often. It, it seems like a very white and black conversation. Um, do you think that you see that changing in, in light of everything that's been happening and attacks on Asians since the pandemic? Yeah, I think the conversation that we have about race in America is stratified into just two poles, right? There's white folks, there's black folks, and we really have failed to talk about anyone who is not in one of those two groups. What we're seeing now is Asian Americans are, for some reason, um, a surprise in terms of the racial discourse of this country. And it's because of that failure. It's because we really only had the conversation in this one way where it's a racial binary. Um, I'm really hopeful that this moment means that we will have a continued conversation about what it's like to be an Asian American as a racialized community in America. Um, but the impulse to erase that experience is also really strong. Do you think the impulse to erase that experience in part comes from the Asian experience to erase ourselves? You know, I think that there is a part of what we do as Asian Americans that is self-appointed, right? So we have this narrative that we are quiet, we are not going to be politically activated or charged and not take up a lot of space and visibility. And so part of that is it's internalized. The other reality, I think, is that it's a manufactured narrative about Asian Americans. Um, so the rubric of talking about us is through that lens of we don't take up a lot of space. So we're not really politically active. Um, we don't experience racism in any way, shape or form, let alone to the extent of really obvious forms of racial violence. Do you remember when you had your first incident where somebody shouted a racial epithet at you? Because I, I sure do. Yeah, I remember all of them. Um, I remember being at a supermarket with my mom when I was about six or seven years old and she got into a fender bender basically with someone from the store as she was pulling out of a parking lot or out of a parking spot rather. And the person got out of their car and my mom and I got out of our car, you know, to do the thing where you exchange your Insurance. information. Yeah. And they just started kind of yelling, go back to your country, go back to your country. Um, and that was the first time in, in one of many, you know, it's happened over and over again. And most recently, there's been a lot of stuff in my life that's happened over the course of this last year. Can you talk a little bit about what you mean? We live in a really progressive town. You know, it's it, Oakland, California is known for being really liberal. There's been a really cool political, social protest movements here. Um, but when I was walking the dog by myself, I started to notice that people would pull away from me, specifically like, young white women started, you know, like pulling their jackets closer, um, crossing the street, crossing the street so that they would be further from you. Exactly. Here. And it's really hard to miss because it's just me and my dog on the street with you. So if it's just me 
and my tiny dog and you suddenly cross the street, there's no mistaking it for anything else. You attribute that to Asianness and not just sort of COVID social distancing. No, because I would see them walk down the street and there were other people who were sharing the sidewalk with them and they wouldn't move away. Mm. So it was very clear to me that the thing that was doing the work was what I looked like. There was a Burmese family in Texas who was stabbed inside of a Sam's Club. And that really changed how I engaged with being in public. So we started changing whether or not I would walk the dog alone. Uh, my mom has stopped going to the ATM by herself. That's painful. Yeah, it's been a really painful year. Um, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of fear that I feel. There's a lot of fear that my family feels. Yeah, when we talk about police brutality, we're in generally talking about unarmed Black people. Yeah. But there are instances of Asians unarmed also being killed and brutalized by police, and yet we don't hear about it. So why is that? I would say that a lot of the invisibility and the erasure that Asian Americans experience have to do with how uncomfortable it is to admit that racism is a widespread problem. Asian Americans have always been pitted against other communities of color as more politically amenable, as closer in proximity to white Americans. And so a lot of the actual realities of being Asian American are totally eclipsed, right? We are the community with the largest racial or wealth gap of any community of color. So within Asian America, you're going to have South Asians who out earn white men. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to have Cambodian folks who make about the same as Latinx folks mm -hmm. in America. And we really fail to talk about that because we want it to be much more easy to fold Asian Americans into this narrative. Look, they made it. All right, so there's a lot to unpack in those two videos. The floor is open. Did anything um, resonate or stand out for you? I can't remember what exactly they said, but they said something. One of the men at the first one said something about all forms of oppression are related, but I think it was a little different than that. I can't remember, but yeah, I mean, that's definitely true. Mm -hmm. Very obviously, but. And Janet, I saw your hand. I'm coming to you next. Um, so I just, I jotted down a few things. Um, one was the, the statement that all forms of oppression are linked. Um, and how powerful that is. Mm -hmm. um, and then the idea of internalized racism, um, mm -hmm. how you are treated and othered can seep into how you um, grow to see yourself. Um, mm -hmm. And then the idea of, of muting yourself to make others feel more comfortable. And what would make us prioritize someone else's comfort over our own. And I think that links back to oppression and internalized racism. Um, so yeah, those are some things that stood out to me. Janet, please go ahead and unmute. Um, I think I'm unmuted. Yep. Um, I, I was thinking, uh, I don't even think of racial difference when it comes to Asians, but it's because I have a daughter who's full-blooded uh, Korean and her two daughters, her three children are half Korean, and one of them is half Native American. <clears throat> but when she moved um, to, she moved for her job uh, near Oshkosh and settled in a small town, Amu, because she thought a small town would be a good place for the kids to be. Um, her, her girls had to take the bus to school, and the bus was the biggest problem that we as far as they were telling me, because they were in a confined space where bullies could bully. And um, nobody was around to stop them. And I remember one time one of the bullies was after the oldest girl and telling her, of course, to go back where she came from. And she was nothing but, I don't remember what. 
And the younger one was so furious. She was, she was a quiet girl. Um, she was so furious that she just yelled at that boy and leave my sister alone and da 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 that kind of thing. Um, and my daughter did go into the school and complain and took a long time, but things got better. But that younger girl stopped speaking, um, except in the classroom when she was in school. She she was alone. She ate alone. Uh, and she said that was fine. But I mean, it, it really silenced her um, to be <clears throat> part of a, di a group of different people who weren't free to be free. In that community. So she's just coming, she's just coming out of that now. Um, but it's been years. Thank you for sharing that. Um, all right, I'm I'm checking the time. We have 15 minutes left. We have a few more videos that I want to show you. We're gonna get through as much as we can, and anything <clears throat> that we can't get to before seven, um, I will put in the chat. Um, so kind of to tie a bow at the end of this portion of our segment, when we're talking about um, racism experienced by, by Asian people, and then is there a binary of black and white with respect to racism? Um, so the next video is just under eight minutes, and it's are Asians next in line to be white? So it really discusses um, whiteness and what that means um, from an Asian perspective. So I'll go ahead and start the video. We've reached the last episode of our mini-series. No! That's so sad. Since it's our final one, why don't we think about exploring a more philosophical question for this episode? I like that idea. What do you have in mind? All right, I'll set the stage for us with a few lines from one of our favorite writers, Kathy Park Hong. When I hear the phrase, Asians are next in line to be white, I replace the word white with disappear. Asians are next in line to be white. I have definitely heard that before. And it always really, really bothered me because I feel like it's such a racist sentiment. Yet, it's hard to pinpoint exactly why. Well, why don't we tackle that question in this last episode? Are Asians next in line to be white? Welcome to the People's History of Asian America. Remember that scene in Get Out where there's that one Asian guy at that all-white barbecue? Oh, trust me, I remember. We first see him when Daniel Kaluuya's character, Chris, thinks he's meeting his white girlfriend's family. Except, all these white people are actually there to buy his body. Including that one Asian guy. But then, there's also the movie, Do the Right Thing, where there's that one Asian grocery store in a predominantly Black neighborhood. What do you see? I don't judge us. D, that's C, D. When Sal's pizzeria is set ablaze, Sunny, the Korean store owner, becomes a target of the mob. And he tries to defend himself, shouting, I'm black, I'm black, as if that's going to keep him safe. You can see the confusion among black folks in this scene, too. Does this Korean man have white privilege? Because he's certainly not black. But still, as a store owner, he's financially benefiting from black people. What I think is so brilliant about both of these movies is their commentary on Asian proximity to whiteness. In Get Out, the Asian character aligns himself with whiteness so much that he participates in the oppression and potential murder of a Black person. In Do the Right Thing, the Asian character aligns himself against whiteness so much that he claims Blackness, but only when it was convenient for him to save himself. Understanding how the idea of whiteness has been constructed is central to the violence depicted in both of the movies that we talked about, but it is also central to answering our question, are Asian people next in line to be white? So how did we arrive on the modern concept of whiteness? Let's turn to critical race theorist Cheryl Harris. Now, according to Professor Harris, whiteness isn't just about skin color. Whiteness is actually inscribed into the law itself specifically in how certain people can own property at the expense of others. There are two ways this manifested in American history. Number one, black people could not possess their bodies and labor. And number two, native people could not possess land and natural resources. So what you're saying is whiteness isn't just about race or skin color. 
It's actually about the exploitation of land and people. Exactly. And we can see how Asian Americans have attempted to claim legal whiteness multiple times in history and were then shown their place in America's racial hierarchy. 1922, Ozawa versus the United States. Takao Ozawa was born in Japan and lived in the U.S. for 20 years. He applied for naturalization, which at that time was only offered to free white persons or persons of African descent. Instead of challenging the constitutionality of these racial restrictions, Ozawa claimed that Japanese people, because they were so light-skinned, should be considered free white persons. The Supreme Court unanimously ruled against Ozawa, stating that the words white person only referred to those of the Caucasian race. But even Caucasian was not enough. Whiteness as a concept continued to evolve. 1923, Tin versus United States. Just a year later, using the logic from Ozawa's case, a Sikh Punjabi American also tries to sue for naturalization by claiming that he's technically of the Caucasian race by being of Aryan descent and a high caste Hindu. But the Supreme Court ruled against Bhagat Singh Tint, changing their definition of whiteness and Caucasian to be defined by the perception of the common man, aka the socially acceptable definition of white. And this is how the law acknowledged that race is a social construct. To paraphrase Professor Harris, Whiteness emerged as an ideology and a legal framework to ensure that a certain group of people held power over others. And as if Asian Americans didn't learn their lesson the first two times they sued for whiteness, five years later, there was yet another attempt, this time in the Mississippi Delta during the age of racial segregation. 1927, Lum versus Rice. Gong Lum, a Chinese American grocery store owner in the South, sues his local white public school for kicking out his daughter, Martha Lum, for being colored. Instead of claiming that segregated schools are inherently unequal, the Lum family tries to claim that Martha Lum was not colored. The court unanimously ruled against the Lum family, stating that segregated education was to be divided between the pure white or Caucasian race and colored people, which explicitly meant the brown, yellow, and black races. And because Martha Lum was supposedly part of the Mongolian or yellow race, she could not be enrolled in white schools. Yet another case that brings home the point that no matter how light-skinned, how financially successful, how model of a minority Asian people may be, they will never be considered white. All of this goes to show that, one, claiming whiteness will never work as a response to racial injustice because whiteness and white supremacy is actually about producing and maintaining inequality. And two, resorting to anti-blackness will not only hinder justice for Asian Americans, but all communities who are perceived as not white. To close out this last episode of our show, A People's History of Asian America, your favorite show, here are the powerful words of Kathy Park Hong once again, exploring why whiteness will make Asian people disappear. When I hear the phrase, Asians are next in line to be white, I replace the word white with disappear. Asians are next in line to disappear. We are reputed to be so accomplished and so law-abiding we will disappear into this country's amnesiac fog. We will not be the power, but become absorbed by power. Not share the power of whites, but be stooges to a white ideology that exploited our ancestors. Ethnic studies is here. So if you love our show, make sure you share this. All right, so I will open the floor briefly. We'll try to squeeze in one more video. If there's anything that resonated from that one, um, please go ahead and unmute. I just like the way that they affirmed that uh, the definition of white has very little to do with skin color and uh, almost everything to do with maintaining the status quo. Right. 
All right. Um, we are not going to be able to watch both of the videos, but I think we can fit in the last one. So I'm going to put all of the links in the chat. Please do, when you have a moment, um, check those out. Um, we will have time for a visual poem on AANHPI perspectives. That will bring us to a close. I'll jump on really quick. We're gonna be a couple minutes after seven, so I hope that's okay with everyone. Um, and then we'll have an opportunity for announcements before the parking lot is open. So prepare as a physician to step out into the world with one strike against you, and that your goal is to be invisible. I feel like as Asians in America, what does bind us together is the fact that our fears and traumas in relationship to America is very similar. Showing up, it felt so other, like other and their next question is, well, how do you speak English so well? My experience was hiding my Asianness. Growing up here, you don't want to be Asian because you feel ashamed or you don't feel like you belong. Growing up as the, the only Asian kid, um, yeah, I definitely got teased a lot through like my eyes and being Asian was not cool. I am 50% Filipino, but sometimes I feel like I'm, you know, a sliver. I want to be normal or or be not that Asian, right? And that I did everything in my power to be that way. And in doing so, I pushed away so much of my true self. You're really cool as an Asian person, or like, oh, you're really hot as an Asian person, or specifically men trying to find a way to say that they have Asian girlfriends or have Asian exes or Asian wives. Everywhere I would go. especially they wanted to be American so we get pushed to be American 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 look at these white people be just like these white people do this so that you're just like them and you can hopefully by us moving to this country succeed just like hopefully a white person but I think since we're still kind of apologizing to them while we're doing our thing it doesn't feel like we're we're even being authentic yet I have felt invisible, that I'm just a part of their journey rather than being a part of my own. I feel like for so many years, we've been trying to get folks to see us, but it's been in a very surface level way. So many of us felt adrift, so many of us felt isolated, so many of us felt like there was a precedent for who we were. For a long time, I was like, am I just Asian? Am I just Filipino? Like, when do I become American? If you truly ask me, um, I was never taught the API history. My dad, when he came to this country, I said, don't speak to them in Tagalog, they'll never be accepted. I feel like I was robbed of my language. I, and, and at one point, I just like, tried to like drop 
ethnicity all at once because I just felt hurt on all sides. He dealt with respect and religion politics. This is we are supposed to be the model minority. Just kind of work with yourself trying to fit an image, but you don't really have value in this some sort of a hashtag, and even that, it's fleeting, you know, disappears. Globally, when I go out to me and Mussy, they call me short in California. I think we can embrace being different more. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Just being yourself and like doing your own thing is like it's American enough, it's Korean enough because you are Korean and like there's nothing wrong with anyone in any race, religion, culture, whatever, gender. To be Asian American is its own thing and it's not any one thing. There's no <laughs> there, there, there's so many different like doubles to the super beautiful shiny gem. I feel like once we are able to truly convey the extremities of our experiences in America without trying to make it comfortable or appeasing to whiteness. That's when other folks outside of our culture will truly see us for who we are. You know, from my experience of being Black and Asian, I've noticed the best way is to be the Black and Asian. Like, to be a defiant act identity and self determination It's true. I feel like, yeah, growing up in a really predominantly white space, yeah, I was not. I didn't really accept that word. Someone more American, whatever that even was. So the Korean community so that I had, I wanted to be more white, but then now I'm like, oh. All right, so that concludes our videos for this month's Courageous Conversation. Hopefully uh, you enjoyed those. Uh, I have a few announcements and then I will turn the floor over to Neil to see if Diversity Action Team would like to share announcements as well. Um, so as always, we have lots of things going on at YWCA Rock County. Um, our Juneteenth is coming up, which is actually my second announcement. Um, but before we get to Juneteenth, we are having a fundraiser for that event. Um, it is going to be our alumni basketball game at Beloit Memorial High School in the Barkin Arena on Saturday, June 1st. So if you are in the area, please feel free to stop by. I included the, actually, let me stop the recording.